Hi, everyone. Welcome to yet another lovely event here. My name's Kai. I'm a member of the social media fleet here at Mysterious Galaxy. And today we're celebrating of Kate Kavari's book, A Botanist's Guide to Parties and Poisons. Such a great title, by the way, Kate. Super <laughs> awesome. <laughs> So Kay Kavari, our author today, is the author of fiction ranging from historical mysteries to high fantasy epics. Something that's very evident throughout her work is her deep appreciation for research and creativity. Awesome. And in conversation with Kate today is Catherine Shellman. She's the author of Lily Adler Mysteries and The Nightingale Mysteries, both of which are held in high regard by Publishers Weekly and Suspense Magazine. Some pre-event reminders uh, for you guys today is that uh, we wanted to extend a thank you to Kate for signing book plates for us, which are available through the Mysterious Galaxy website along with the book. And um, Catherine did mention that there were also signed books available to you guys. So um, you can find the link for that in the shiny green box below that reads, Buy a Botanist's Guide to Parties and Poison. Sign book plates here. A kind reminder that your purchase of books through Mysterious Galaxy helps us as an indie bookstore to keep doing wonder wonderful events such as this. Yeah. So um, Kate and Catherine will be doing an audience Q&A around a 30 minute mark. So be sure to submit all of your questions to the Ask a Question tab below. And without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Kate Kavari and Catherine Shellman. Yay. Have fun, you guys. Thanks, Thank Kai. you so much, Kai. Congratulations, Kate. You're wrapping up um, Pup Week of your, your debut novel. How are you feeling? Thank you. I'm honestly feeling exhausted. <laughs> that sounds about um, like, right. It, yeah. is, it is like like emotionally exhausting for sure. You know, my book baby's out in the world, but also like doing events, and like talking to people. I have definitely been one of those pandemic people that has talked to like two people for weeks at a time. And one of them is a three-year-old. So... <laughs> It is really fun and exciting to get to talk to like real people in real life, but it is, it's challenging when you're used to not doing that. And you've been running all over doing all kinds of events for the last week, haven't you? Yeah. And there's, there's still lots more to come. So I'm happy to talk to people here, but if you want more about a botanist guide, then you can check out my website where I have all of my events listed. Perfect. Well, we're going to make you talk a little bit more tonight. <laughs> Oh yeah. So, um, why don't you start by by telling everyone a little bit about yourself? Was was being a writer always something you wanted to do? Um, no, it kind of came out of maybe not nowhere because I was definitely always like really uh, in love with the idea of writing and reading when I was a child. But like I had totally gotten away from that, um, and then it it just kind of came upon me one day. I had found. Um, the Miss Fisher's Murder Mysteries books and television show oh, so and good. fell in love with it. So good. I have literally like half of the series right here behind me on the shelf. I have to interrupt. Did you see, read the books first or did you watch the series first? I watched, I think maybe like half of the first season and then I realized that they were based off of books and then I started reading all of the books um, while watching the show. Yeah, I did the exact same thing. I was like, oh, I've got to read them all. Yeah, but that, I mean, the show is very different from the books um, in a good way because it's a different, I feel like it's kind of a different story. The premise is the same, but the story itself is different. It but I digress. Sense. I could talk about, I could talk about Franny Fisher like all day. All right, so you um, started reading and watching Miss Fisher and that got you into to mysteries. How did that go? Yeah, I mean, I, like, I grew up watching, like, Agatha Christie's Poirot and Sherlock and all of this, so, like, I was definitely already a person who loved historical mystery, um, but I had kind of gotten away from reading, like, anything at all apart from, like, textbooks, really, in college, uh, and then I found Miss Fisher, and I was right back into it, and I just binge read <laughs> mysteries and historical mysteries for, like, a year, uh, and then I just, one day I was like, why can't I find the perfect book? Like, why can't I find the book that checks all the boxes? It has everything that I want in it. Uh, and then I was like, why don't I write that book? And so uh, this first Saffron book is me trying to, to check all of my boxes. And so it's like my perfect, my perfect mystery. Oh, that's so fun. So I know you've written in a few other genres. Had you done that before you started working on the first Saffron book or how, what, what order did that go in? Saffron is the, the OG project. She is 
she is what I started with. And then I kind of took a break while I was um, teaching. And when I was pregnant with my son, it was uh, all of my creative energy was towards creating a child, I guess. I don't know. Um, and so it's I took a break. Tired, so. <laughs> yeah, just a little exhausted constantly all day, every day. Um, but when my son was born, I was right back to binge reading, you know, you're up half the night and, uh, thank God for books because without them, I think I would have been really miserable, but you've got um, nothing else to do in the middle of the night. So you might yeah, as well read them. Nothing else to do. And so I, I read, um, not historical fiction that time, but I read, um, fantasy. I read a lot of urban fantasy, like all of the vampire books I could get my hands on. So uh, after that time, you know, when my son was like a year old or so, I wrote uh, a series of books about vampires. I wrote a high fantasy um, story that is mostly about motherhood and um, like a matriarchy. So I, I definitely write what I read. And so now I'm I am just a huge mixture of of everything. I think. I think reading fantasy is so good for anyone who writes historical fiction because there's so many good lessons about world building in fantasy and how you share information with your readers that are so applicable to writing historical fiction. I don't know if you found anything, found something oh similar. Gosh, like absolutely. That. Absolutely. I was talking to um, Greer McAllister the other day who wrote, mm -hmm. um, you know, she's written a lot of historical fiction, but also she just released this matriarchal fantasy really like gritty kind of game of thrones but it's about women it's and so we were talking about if anyone wants to pick it up it's so yes. it is it will blow your mind it will blow your mind um but we were talking about all the similarities between um historical fiction and and fantasy because you have to figure out the like what requires explanation and what readers can like fill in for themselves mm -hmm. but also the cultural stuff I found that like really challenging in writing historical fiction is that I'm trying to hold back my cultural understanding of like, um, you know, how men and women interact and, and a woman's place in society back then and all of these things. Cause now we're like a woman's place in society. What are you talking about? <laughs> so, uh, and figuring out how to balance that more like modern um, feel for things with, how things were like people people had strong opinions about that yeah you have to you have to get the the tone of it just right and you have to mm -hmm. reveal it in the right way right like you yeah. have there's there's information like you said you that you tell your audience straight out there's information you let them figure out on their own or there's those details that maybe you you give them at the beginning but don't get a full explanation until later and mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a tricky balancing act which you do a lovely job at at in, in botanist guide to parties and poisons. Thank you. I so, appreciate it. Sounds like you've been a very prolific writer since you started. Is is writing a bit of a thing in your family? Do I remember reading that? Um yeah, my uh younger brother has a degree in it. He's in the other room visiting actually so like talking about him he's right over there. Um <laughs> he, he has a degree in writing. He writes more of like along a literary bent. He does um poetry and he also does comedy, so he's hilarious if anybody needs a comedian in New York. <laughs> he's there performing. He's hilarious. Um, and my older brother was the one who introduced me to Nano Remo like years and years and years ago. Uh, and now my mom, my mom writes uh, mysteries as well. Um, well so you, you have a very literary family then. They must yes. be so proud of you. Yeah, I mean, they're they're my alpha readers. They're like the first people who I go to and I say, hey, I'm having this problem. Can you fix it? Um, because they, they're really familiar with the genre and they're very, like, they're very familiar with the writing process as well. So I'm super lucky because they, they know how to do all the things that I struggle with. So that's, that's a good balance to have. Mm -hmm. I think you need readers who can, who, whose strengths maybe complement yours a bit. Exactly. Exactly. They definitely help me out and they're very supportive and they never, none of my family members were like, you're going to write a book about a botanist? Like, what are you talking about? Nobody was like that. Everyone was like, oh yeah, like a, a mystery about a botanist would be great. You should write that. Well, I mean, if no one else has done it before, then there's an opening in the market. Might as well be the one to do it. For sure. Uh, 
so how did you how did you end up deciding on your main character being a botanist? Was that a particular interest of yours? Yeah, I've always really enjoyed gardening and plants. Um, and when I started to come up with the idea for like, I would really like to write like the classic like dinner party murder mystery, I needed a reason why all of these people were together. And I thought a university would be a really fun environment. Um, because, you know, you have kind of the drama of like who who's doing what for, for what reason and um, who's getting the funding and how they're getting the funding and all of all of those kind of little um, things that could easily spiral into a motive for murder or whatever. Um, and then I was like, well, my my main character needs a discipline. If she's at a university, she needs to have a discipline. Uh, and I was basically thinking, what would I not mind spending hours and hours and hours researching? Um, and I came up with a couple ideas, but botany was at the top of the list because with botany, you get a whole bunch of poisonous things. Yeah, it's it's very good fodder for a mystery. Cause like you said, academia can be quite cutthroat, usually in a more like symbolic sense, but you know, in a literal <laughs> one this time. Yes. Not like literal, exactly. but there was poison involved. But uh, so you started with the the botanical research then, like what was the what was the process for that? Like, did you how, how did you even start? I'm so curious. Um, well, I have since changed my ways, but this book was completely pantsed. Uh, I just sat down and started writing and I just let whatever because it was my first book I'd ever written. I just let all of the ideas come out. Um, and that is perhaps why it took me four years of editing to get it <laughs> published. Um, but I, it was so much fun. It was the most fun, like I've had doing any kind of project for myself. So, uh, pantsing was the way to go, I guess. Uh, but that meant that there was a lot of stopping and starting. Um, a lot of the time I think that people do kind of front end research so that way they don't have to stop and start, um, you know, they gather ideas and they have an outline or whatever. I'm sure you do the same thing when you're when you're preparing. You, I don't, I don't know. Maybe you don't. <laughs> I think no matter what, they're stopping and starting. Yeah. There's always going to be. Uh, some but people, people always say they do like the double X in their manuscripts or like a K or something to signal that you need to come back and fill in this detail. But my brain does not let me do that. Um, I have to go and find the detail and the answer like right away. So. Um, that first book, I think it, I drafted it very quickly. It took me about three weeks to draft. Um, but about half of that time was research, stopping and starting and figuring out what plants I wanted to include and um, in, information about the university and all of that kind of stuff. And with the, um, with but, the botanist, like you said, with poisonous plants, that gives you so many options to choose from in terms of like, but you ended up inventing right. one, which I think is such an interesting choice to make. How did you, how did you come up with it? Wait, can you, how do you pronounce it? Cause I've only read it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, okay. Um, in my head, I always say it wrong. Um, so when the uh, voice actor who does the, she does an amazing job with the narration for the audiobook. Um, we talked it through and she did some research and I did some research and we concluded that we should probably pronounce it shalotl like with a sh or like a soft ch sound um which is definitely not how i say it in my head but i'm not gonna say it the wrong way and get it into your head so it's shalotl I, hearing that i think i probably i was maybe saying it the same wrong way you were in my head probably but, it's like so a how hard you, yeah, yeah how did you decide to in, invent your own possibly very very deadly plant it was it was honestly like, I, I just wanted to do it. Like, I, I mean, I didn't have a great reason. It was my first book. I think maybe I would not invent one now if I was redoing it, but um, it was really fun to figure out what the symptoms of the poisoning were that I wanted to do and like kind of the mythology surrounding the plant. Um, coming up with the Latin name was really fun because I had to like do research about how they name um plants using Latin names and things like that. Um, well, I thought it was such yeah. a great choice to invent your own plant because then there's this air of mystery around it. You know, if you, if you pick a poison that everyone's, you know, heard of in Agatha Christie already, then everyone knows exactly what the symptoms are and exactly mm -hmm. how it affects you and everything. But this one, 
no one quite knows. Everyone has this idea of what it's going to do, but you know, maybe there's more to it than that. And it's, it made yeah. for some, some very suspenseful moments for the character. So I thought that was such a cool idea to have invented your own, <laughs> your own mysterious poison for this. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Really, truly, the the main reason for it, I think, apart from just like it, it sounded like a fun thing to do, was just so I could get that scene of Alexander and Saffron talking about the poisoning when she is poisoned. So that's that's my favorite scene in the whole book. So I hope that everyone will get the book just so they can read our heroine and hero arguing about <laughs> about her being poisoned arguing about poison when she is poisoned. <laughs> yeah. um, so, I mean, you didn't, you had to do all that, like the botany research. Mm -hmm. um, you had to do all the historical research and then you had to, to figure out how to, how to write a mystery. Cause you said you'd never done one of that before. How was creating that balance between, you know, here's the very solid facts and the history. And then here's mm -hmm. the this, this story I'm putting together. What was that like for you the doing it the first time around? Did it sort of just flow out or was it a bit of a challenge to piece it all together? It honestly just kind of flowed out. But the reason why it flowed out was because I had read so many mysteries at that point, like in close, quick succession that the beats of a mystery story were really like in my head. So like you have the initial incident and then you have like the first clue. And then, you know, as you go on, like you know, the salt, you get the wrong solve and climax and resolution all of that so that was like it was really in my head at that point um and i i didn't like outline it or anything that came later when i was revising but um if you want to try to write a book read read a whole bunch of of books in the same genre so that way you can get the beats in your head and then you don't have to revise a million times <laughs> I mean, we still probably revise it a million times, right? There's oh, always, <laughs> but yeah, I think it's, that's such good advice. You know, you have, that way you have this structure in your head that you can follow along with, and then you can decide when you want to subvert it because it's always fun mm -hmm. to, to play with those reader expectations, but you need to know what the expectations are before you maybe sneak exactly. a, little, a little twist exactly. in there. Um, but another thing that I thought was, uh, what you said about balancing all of these aspects to it was that I, I was really, because I was pantsing and I didn't have an outline and a plan and I was researching along, along the way, as I found new information, it changed where the plot went and it changed how I just like made decisions. Um, like for example, there is, um, there's a moment where oh, now I'm forgetting it, but there's a moment where, um, Saffron is like going into this library and, and there are these, you know, the, the mean guys, like mean girls, but like make it 1920s academia. <laughs> They're like swinging around. And, and so mapping out where that happened at the university, was it gonna, like, where was it going to take place? I think was, um, it was something that was influenced by my research of this space because like realistically would they have seen each other in this certain hall that I had originally planned that confrontation in, you know, it would probably be in this other location. I mean, it's like little stuff like that, that individually it's perhaps not that impressive, but like when you take the story as a whole, it feels more organic because the history and the research has come into it to make it how it actually would be, if that makes sense. I think that's so true. You have to have that really strong understanding of the world. And like you said, it's details that readers are probably never going to notice, mm -hmm. but it gives you such a strong grasp of the world you're writing in and this world that your characters are inhabiting that it, I think it makes whatever they do flow more so much more easily because it feels so natural for them in that moment, in that context. Yeah. Um, and it's also just really, it's fun to do the research, I think. Like, I love the his, the history side of it, uh, even though like 70% of it never ends up in the book. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the crazy thing is that you do all of this research. Like, uh, I spent probably two or three hours researching a scene that, I mean, in, the entire scene might end up on the cutting room floor. Mm-hmm maybe just one sentence of that research will make it in. But it's it's important for you as the writer to have mm -hmm. it, to have it there and to mm -hmm. have it in your mind for your your own sense of your world and your characters. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
sort of speaking of the, the history side of it, um, so the book takes place in 1920s during the interwar period. Mm -hmm. uh, but World War I is still very much in the characters' minds. Uh, and so I'm so curious about the research you did there and the, the role that that played in, in shaping people's lives in the 1920s, both in real life and, and for your book. Could you talk a little bit about that for us? Yes. Um, if anyone had told me like 10 years ago that I would be writing uh, like a historical fiction book, I don't think I would have believed them because history was never something I was like super into. I watched historical fiction growing up, but I was never interested in it from the historical angle. It was more the world building part that I thought was really fascinating. The idea of people like humans still living their life, but in very different social constructs. Um, and so coming into a historical mystery, I realized very quickly that I couldn't like ignore the historical part. I had to actually like do the research and, and figure out what it meant. Um, but learning about history now, doing it through the lens of characters makes it so much more interesting than it was when I was taught it in school. Um, because in school, it's just names and dates and like locations on a map. But when you're thinking about who are these people and like, what are their lives actually like? You have to understand like what the events are that are going on. So for Alexander, he is um, Saffron's kind of co-conspirator. He's also a veteran of the First World War. He is scarred inside and out by his service. Um, and so learning about where he would have served, how his injuries would have been treated, um, what were his methods of coping with the physical trauma as well as the mental trauma, um, like realistically, I thought was um, probably my favorite part of the history aspect of this book, just because it, it was a character. I was researching a character and building a person and not trying to figure out like a street name or like what kind of shoe Saffron would be wearing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and so it made it so much more relevant and so much more exciting to find out like who is this guy and like what's his deal. Um, and that was it was very interesting to me. And um, to continue what you said about its impact on the characters kind of as a whole. Um, I taught fifth grade before I was um, staying at home and doing the writing thing and the mom thing. Uh, and I taught American history, but we spent a lot of time on World War I. Um, and so one of the big takeaways that we did for that unit was about what were the changes that took place as a result of the First World War. Uh, and so we talked a lot about technology. We talked a lot about science. There's so um, much in addition, there. It was so much fun. It was so much fun. Um, so we talked about um, technology and science in addition to the social stuff that was going on, like the changing roles of women and like um, how how it affected the like the social classes and things like that. Um, and so I found that that background teaching that stuff, I mean, it was on a fifth grade level, so not quite where I needed to be for Saffron. But, but it gives you your starting point for like, oh, exactly. I know these things happen. I'm going to dive in and find out a little bit more. Exactly. And I talked about it in the um, in the author's note at the very end of the book, um, really talking about just the explosion of science that was happening um, as a result of the First World War. So you had not only the technology that was used in actual wartime, like radios and um, blood banks and all of the horrible parts of it that I don't really want to talk about, <laughs> like weaponry or whatever, um, but you also finally had people able to travel the world again and, and make new discoveries. Like um, anthropology was like this burgeoning um, discipline that was happening at the same time. So that is in part kind of the motivation behind the expedition that takes um, place kind of off, off page in the book. Um, but yeah, it's just, in a war, Europe is super interesting. It's super interesting because it's, it is not war anymore. It's the people and how the people change and adapted and grew. And all those big cultural changes that happened as a result. Yeah. And I don't, I don't talk a whole lot about, um, you know, jazz and alcohol and all of that stuff in this book. There is some of that in the next book for anyone who is interested. 
And while you're waiting for the second Saffron book, you can go read Catherine's new book because that's exactly what's going on. It's a speakeasy, right? So yeah, if so you're it's looking for, for kind of slippers and stuff. It's New York, it's not Europe. So it's got a slightly yeah. different little different vibe less academia more speakeasies <laughs> yeah and that's that's the it's the converse for my book is that I, what i realized i wanted to write about the 20s i was like i don't want to do flappers at least not in this book because that is that's our go-to when we think of the mm -hmm. 20s that's what people think of and i was like no i want to do something different, do something different. yeah mm -hmm. so for for choosing the 20s just as a starting point was it because you had that background in it um, no, it was honestly because of Poirot. Um, and the funny thing is, is that Poirot takes place in the 20s. But like when I think of Poirot, I think of David Suchet on uh, his mustache, like on I think it's Acorn produces that uh, or produced it. It's it's pretty old now. But um, in my head, that was the 1920s. But it's not actually it's the 30s. They produced it. So it's like in the 30s. But in my head, I was like, I'm going to do 20s like Poirot. <laughs> Well, but it is, it is in part because it's really exciting. And um, I did not I did not want to touch Prohibition, which is why it's not in America. And I did not want to touch um, the Great Depression. And so I, I was like, 20 seemed like a safe place interest-wise for me because I, I don't want to spend time on topics I don't enjoy. Yeah. I mean, you, if you're going to be doing that much research, you want it to be something that you actually find very interesting. Absolutely. So we've got, looks like a lot of audience questions coming in. Ooh. So I'm probably going to switch gears in just a moment, but I have one more question for you. Um, so you were talking before the, the broadcast started that you just wrapped up drafting the second book for Saffron. So what can you tell us about that? Um, well, I can give you a hint about what I already said. So there, there's some jazz and some flappers and um a lot a lot of poisonous plants is like there another dead body? more than the first book <laughs> is there another dead body in this one there is there is actually more than one dead body in in this book what was how did the process of writing the second book compare to writing the first one um well i drafted them both in the same like time period so when i first started writing saffron i wrote um i wrote the first book in about three weeks and then i immediately started on the second book and then i immediately did the third book so i wrote like four over the course of a summer um because it was just really i was ready to go i guess um so i i wrote those and then i worked a lot on the first book because I wanted to see if I could do something with it. I wanted to see if I could get it published. And so the second book and the other books have just been languishing on my Google Drive. And so rereading them, and I had to show the second book um, to my editor when she was buying them. And I was like, just just know that I will fix it. I will fix this book. <laughs> because it was, it was so bad. It was so bad. Um, I think so first, it was first drafts are always cool. like, no, no, let me, let yeah, me. I'm like, don't just ignore everything. Ignore the whole book. Don't even read it. Um, <laughs> so it was a very similar process actually, because I was taking something that I had written quite a while ago and tearing it apart and choosing the things that I wanted to keep and then rewriting it to see uh, if I can make something better. So it's like a beautiful Frankenstein book <laughs> of old and new, um, yeah, and it's so much fun. It's so much fun. There's a new character because we got to have kind of a investigatory assistant and Alexander might not be there. So absence makes the heart grow fonder. Here's hoping. <laughs> Here's hoping that's what happens. So what's the, do you have a title for the second one yet? I do. I love, like, I somehow love the title even more than the first one. It's called A Botanist's Guide to Flowers and Fatality. Oh, fun. So was that, was that naming convention something that came up during the editorial process or was that the name you originally had given it? Oh, no. My names were not good originally. I credit 100% the cover and the title are all, Crooked Lane marketing team, 
they're amazing because they took my story and like dressed it up so beautifully and I love it. They did an amazing job. They did a lovely job, but they had a good story to work with to start out. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, it's a little, this is earlier than they told us to switch the Q&A, but people keep popping questions in there. So I'm just going to, I'm going to do it. And if we have more time afterwards, we'll fill it in. But um, so, yes, yeah, so we're starting out. First question, was there something that surprised you about the characters or the plot as you were writing the book? Um, the Well, I, I like to joke that the, uh, the entire plot surprised me because I was pantsing it. Pantsing is when you don't have an outline and you just start writing and whatever happens, happens. Um, but there is, there is a moment kind of at the, at the climax of the story where a door is opened and um, there is something surprising on the other side. And when I was writing it, I didn't know what was going to be on the other side until they opened the door. <laughs> so that was that was a fun surprise. And then the other thing that surprised me about the characters is really the character of Alexander continuously surprises me. I don't know what it is about him, but like every time I write him something something new, some new facet of his personality or his background comes up and I'm always like, this person I invented is so interesting and cool. I didn't know. <laughs> well, that just means you really enjoy hanging out with him while you're writing. Exactly. He was, he was in the original draft though, right? He wasn't. Oh a, yeah. Oh yeah. Writer. He he and Saffron came into existence practically at the same time. I mean, they are they work very well together as partners, so that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, so let's see, next question. So what are some genre conve conventions that you love and some you want to go away? So probably either in in historical mysteries or mysteries in general or in historical fiction. That's a really interesting one. Ooh. Okay, my number one pet peeve about mysteries, thrillers, crime, whatever, is I cannot stand the villain's explanation. Like their speech at the end, they've got the they've got the hero and the heroine, and they're about to like drop them over the cliff, and they're like, "Here's why I'm doing this." The monologuing. Yes, the monologuing. I hate it. I hate it. So, um, do not look for that in in this book. Actually, the uh, the bad guy specifically says, "You know what? I'm not gonna tell you. I'm not gonna tell you anything," uh, because I hate that. I hate that so much. But it is necess it's necessary to some extent. Like the reader has to understand why the body is doing the thing. So that's that's something I really hate. Well, that's one of the nice things about sort of the either the amateur or the professional sleuth genre of mysteries of crime fiction is that your main character gets to give the wrap up at the end. You don't need the villain to be monologuing because then you get your sleuth coming in and just having their moment in the sun to just say, I'm going to lay it all out for you. And I'm going to tell you exactly what went down and why, like Poirot style. Exactly. Poirot with his little, like, let me tell you how it is. I love it. Which is such a fun moment for you to be giving Saffron in this, because of course she's been dealing with I mean, aside from really Alexander, lots of people who've been underestimating her mm -hmm. for the whole book. Um, so that had to be very cathartic for, for you as an author and for your character to have that moment at the end. Yeah. Well, and I'll, I'll be honest with you. Saffron, uh, this is her first mystery. She is the biggest amateur, right? Like she doesn't know what she's doing. And so she like makes mistakes and she doesn't always like get the right answer. And so that was one thing that I really enjoyed is that having that mixture of she does know the answer and she doesn't know the answer. So you get that moment of victory, but you also get this like, um, like realistic moment of like, well, she's not Sherlock. She's not going to put it all together in like 30 seconds and solve the crime for you. Right. Which I think is, is it makes for a much more refreshing read because it, it humanizes the character a lot. You know, it's yeah. not, there's, there's something very fun about reading a Sherlock mystery and just watching this character be smarter than everyone else and figure it all out. And then you're just trying to keep up with them. But there's also something really wonderful about watching someone really have to figure it out as they go. And, and you know that they will, because that's part of the genre. You're like, okay, I, I know you're going to get there in the end, but there's some, there's some twists and turns along the way and you're not quite there yet. Exactly. Exactly. I wanted, 
when I was doing my checklist of things that I wanted in my perfect book, that was definitely one thing that I wanted was that I did not want the brainiac sleuth who can put together a mystery super quick. I wanted someone who was like real and would make mistakes and um, would, would muddle through to some extent. Makes them more sympathetic. Oh, this is a fun one. So uh, one of the commenters said, I would love to know about your favorite things to grow in your personal garden. Hopefully no poisons, but you know, I won't assume. <laughs> I have to tell you guys the truth. In my biography, in the book, it says that I have a garden with no poisonous plants. Uh, and it's just not true. It's just not true anymore. I was gardening uh, last weekend or the weekend before and I found, not only did I find nightshade um, or belladonna, which is um, the hallucinogenic berries that make your pupils dilate uh, with berries on it, like ripe berries on it. I've also found poison hemlock in my garden. And I was, I literally was like, I'm done. Like I, I quit. I'm a fraud. Like I, I have these plants growing in my garden. I had no idea. Um, that, that but I, I had like no someone idea. pranking you. Like maybe they snuck in there at night and planted them just to mess with you. <laughs> That's what my husband said. He's like, someone's just messing with you. They're trying to see if all this research is going to pay off or not. Um, and it, it totally did because I had been researching these plants for reasons, plot reasons. Um, and so I recognized them. I saw the berries and I was like, that looks exactly like a nightshade berry. And that looks exactly like hemlock. I, w I was very upset because I have a small child and he saw me pulling the plant out and he said, oh, berries. And I'm like, oh my God, please oh, no. no, no berries, no berries here. It was very scary. Um, but anyway, long story short, I don't try to grow poisonous plants. They just happen to grow. They're attracted to me. I put the energy out there and they're like, yes, I'm, I'm growing your garden. They just mysteriously appear. <laughs> yes, I guess, I guess. Um, but I really love to grow um, in my garden outside, I really love to grow, um, salvia. I live in Texas where it's like 104 degrees today, uh, and has been for like three days. It's, it's been so hot. And so salvia is very hardy. It does really well in hot climates. So salvia is a, a big winner. Uh, and then inside, one of my favorite plants to grow is pothos. You can maybe see it a little bit over, maybe. No. Um, pothos because you can propagate it like crazy. You can have like test tubes. Again, I literally have it all over on my desk. Um, they, it propagates really easily. And so you can like make 12 more plants very easily. So you have, you have quite the green thumb then. I try. I also choose plants that I know that I won't kill. Like I don't, I don't keep succulents anymore. You know, when they started being like really hot, like 10 mm -hmm. years ago or whatever, I tried and I killed them all immediately. So I'm jealous. I always kill every plant immediately. Even the ones that people are like, oh, this one is impossible to kill. It'll survive no matter what you do well, to it. That's some pothos. That stuff does not die. You, It'll be floppy and, and looking dead and give it some water and it's fine. I will Why try that one next then. We'll see if that actually can survive my like black thumb of death. Uh, <laughs> So if there was a song, well, this is interesting, to represent the entirety of your book, what would it be? Do you listen to music when you're writing? I do not. I do not. And the, the reason is partially because this is probably like a really silly reason. But I'm like, it takes place in the 1920s. So if I'm going to listen to music, it should be music from the 1920s, like stuff that they would actually listen to. And it is very hard to find a playlist of that music that I actually want to spend time listening to. Um, so I, I don't listen to um, music while I write. Uh, so I don't I don't think I have an answer for that question. I'm sorry. Just is it just the the genre like this music from the 1920s just doesn't do it for you? It really doesn't. It's um it's just not very like conducive to like thinking dancing. Yes, I could yeah. dance to that music, but like typing. Yeah, I'm the same way. I can't listen to anything really while I'm while I'm writing sometimes if I really need to like drown out my kids I might put on some classical music 
But even then, mm-hmm. like, I would much rather just write in silence. Yeah. Did you listen to 20s music for your book, though? I would listen to it before I was writing, like, to mm-hmm. sort of get in the right, in the right mindset. Um, yeah. But it's just, like, I absolutely agree. Like, trying to write with that playing in the background, I would, I would be paying too much attention to the words that someone else was singing and not able to, like, put my own words on the page. Although it was yeah. very fun. There were so many songs that I listened to so many times um, that uh, my the the marketing team at uh, at Minotaur had me put together like a little night, last call of the Nightingale playlist. Yeah. Uh, so that's on Spotify now, which is just like the the like a little dance playlist of 20s tunes. Okay, I'm great. definitely gonna go and find that to listen for the for book two to get me in the mood. But not while you're writing. <laughs> but not while I'm writing. No, I, if I try to listen to music, I end up typing out the lyrics instead of my own words. It's, it's too distracting. Uh, so you, you've written your historical mysteries and you've dabbled a little bit in some various fantasy genres. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there another genre that you would like to write in or would you consider um, you know, pursuing more of the, of the fantasy writing or do you think you'll be sticking with historical mysteries? Give me one second. My room I just turned on. <laughs> <laughs> It's that time of the night. I guess. Here I was worried that my son would wake up and come downstairs, but in the end, it was the vacuum. To the robots me. always get you. Um, that's a great question. So I write um, historical mysteries. I write a lot of fantasy, urban fantasy. I write high fantasy, um, kind of his, historical fantasy also. Um but the number one thing that I read a ton of, but I don't write is romance. I have romance in all of my projects, but none of them is like a true blue HEA romance. So I have a lot of ideas for them. Like I have a folder on my Google drive that says all of my <laughs> romance ideas, like contemporary romance, historical romance, like everything in between. But I, I just never sit down to actually write it. That's like, it's a whole other, a whole other thing to write like a really satisfying romantic arc in just one book yeah and you've gotta you've gotta have just the right idea to to really carry the characters through i'm the same way i read romance so much but i i would love to write one someday but i've never had the idea where i'm like oh that's the one that's the book i'm gonna write and okay but now you have to it. tell us what your favorite romance is i need this information uh, are we talking historical or Please are tell we... me your historical? Please tell me your historical. Oh, I love basically everything by Courtney Milan. Have you ever read any of her work? Yes, she destroys me. I have to mentally oh, single time. To the books. Yes. But and there's I just I love that she ba- she builds every every romance. Like she's got this the core, like the couple is so great, but she always has all these amazing peripheral couples that aren't just like oh, don't worry, they'll get their own book later. Like, no, they have a satisfying story as part of this, as part of this book too. And she always has some like cool scientific thing that her characters are interested in. And like, it just, everything is, oh, it's, it's perfection. I don't remember which book it was, but it, it's like, it's in the, like the governess game. And there's like an heiress, I don't know. I read them a really long time it's ago. The Eris effect. I'm trying to. Remember. Yes, 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 yes. So in in that um, group of stories, there's like a story about botany, and they like use botany in order to talk about genetics. Yes. And that I think I read that around the same time that I was writing Saffron, and so it just oh, like funny. made me so happy to like have the botany connection. Yeah, you can tell that she also does a whole lot of research for her mm-hmm. historicals. And it just, it makes them all so fascinating because she picks something different for each one mm-hmm. to really focus on. Oh, that's fun. I'm glad you read her too. Everyone should read Courtney Milan's books. So, good. Uh, so coming from a, a family of writers, would you ever consider co-writing something with one of your family members? Um, Yes, please. That would be amazing. <laughs> that would be so much fun. I actually, my, um, my husband's uncle, we, we were talking about writing at one point and we ended up like literally spending like an hour plotting out this amazing idea for a contemporary thriller that he had, like a, like a STEM thriller. 
And I was like, can we please write this? It would be so much fun. So yes, if any of my family members want to hang out and write a book with me, that would be amazing. <laughs> that sounds like it would be a really fun project, but also like maybe fraught because if you argue during the process, like it can't be like, well, we're just going to go our separate ways. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You can't, you can't just be like, well, we're not, we're not going to work together. It'll be like, I'll see you next week at the birthday party. Right. Right. We'll, we'll try to put this behind us. No. But that would be really fun to, to collaborate with a family member. It would be so much fun. Especially for, you know, if you all, you all have very similar interests, it sounds like that just, that would dovetail so well. Yeah, I agree. Oh, this is so sweet. Okay. Would you ever write something specifically for your son? And if so, what would it be about? So my son is three. Um, and what is he interested in? He's really interested in like swimming. He loves cars. Um, so I would probably make up like a fantasy story about like a car that turns into a submarine. And so the car can like go swimming and it would That's be something so like that. That's yeah, really it would be something like that. He's he really loves the outdoors, and so it'd be something like outdoorsy and like a little magical, but also sciency. Does he know that well, you write books? He does. He does. I've I've taken him. Um, I am so lucky because my husband is amazing in many ways, but also because he brought our son to my book signings that I've had a couple this week. We'll have a couple more and he, so he's been to the book signings and he just charms the pants off of everybody. He goes, this is my mommy's book. And then he tried to, he like tried to take it away from somebody. Cause he's like, that's my mom's book. <laughs> he tried no, to no, they bought it. It's okay. <laughs> but yes, no, that's a good thing. Take my book. It's good. Um, but yeah, he's a sweetheart. He definitely, he knows. I tell him I'm writing my book and he, um, whenever I have a printed manuscript, he edits it. He says, I'm going to work. He gets a marker and scribbles on it. That's really cute. It's a family of work, piece of work then. Yes. He's everyone's, an excellent editor. Everyone's putting the effort in. Yeah. That's very sweet. Well, and how good, I think it's, I think it's so powerful to have your kids not just seeing you work, but seeing you pursue something you're so passionate about and something that's really like, this is a dream of mine and I'm going to, I'm going to do that. I'm going to put in the time and the work and make it happen. I think that's an amazing thing for, for kids to have the chance to see a parent doing. Absolutely. I agree. Um, oh, so someone wants to know if, did you have a say in the cover design? And they say, it's beautiful. I agree. It's, I think one of the most eye-catching covers out there this this spring and summer definitely i would love to take credit but i can take like no credit um in all honesty they um asked me for like i you know you've been through this process you you say okay we're getting ready to design the cover what are some features that could be included um in in the cover and so i was like a poison bottle and then they come back with this so I, I can't take any credit. I was basically like, let's let's maybe tweak like one or two things, but it's pretty much the cover that I was presented with and it is absolutely gorgeous. It is it is truly stunning. Do you have a cover for the second one yet? Have you seen it? I do, and it is so good. I think I like it. I think I like it better actually. It is it's so beautiful. It's um similar stylistically, of course, um, but it's so good. That's, that's, and that's such a relief too, because uh, I don't know if viewers know this, but depending on the details of your contract in terms of how it's been negotiated or what your agent has gotten for you in, in the negotiations with your publisher, um, you can have more or less say in what your cover looks like. like. Sometimes you have absolutely no say and they don't even ask for your input or your thoughts. Sometimes you get, you know, sort of you get to give sort of critique on on one of the drafts and then they come back. But at some point, your publisher does just present you with a cover and say, here it is. I hope you like it. And you yeah. hope that you've had a chance to see it before then. And you hope that it's a really beautiful one that you feel represents your book well. But sometimes it's just completely out of your hands. So it's uh, you, if you're very lucky, you end up with a cover like Kate's. Yes, I feel I feel so, so lucky, like all of. Almost, I mean, 
I, I hate to reveal this, but I absolutely read the reviews for my book. And so many reviews are like, I bought it for the cover and I stayed for the story. And so I'm, I'm so grateful that they made such an incredible cover. The cover artist is fantastic. We, we all want to say like we don't judge a book by its cover, but everyone I think has been in the library or the bookstore and seen something really eye catching and thought like, well, I'll pick that up. I'll give that a chance. Absolutely. And it does. It does make a big difference. Yeah. Some of my favorite books have absolutely atrocious covers and I put off buying them because I'm like, I don't want this on my bookshelf because it's, they're just not, they're not attractive. It, but it happens. It happens. Sometimes. You, you, you read them anyway, because they're so good. And you hope that other people pick them up too, in spite of the cover. Yes. Um, do you ever do uh, like fan casting of your book in your mind? Like, would you have people that you would cast as your main characters if it were going to be a movie? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I don't know any, I don't, I honestly don't know any author that hasn't at least considered it, if not like physically gone on Pinterest and like downloaded pictures to make a collage. Um, I, I have pictures of some fan casting actually on my Instagram page, which is at author K Kavari. Um, so feel free to go and look because I definitely have posted some stuff. But um, the I don't know what the, it's a very long name. It's like the Potato Peel and Literary Society of Guernsey. I don't know how oh, to yeah. mm -hmm. it But it, you know, it's that. And it has Lily James in it and that guy whose name I can never remember. But like they are perfectly Alexander and Saffron, like perfectly. I didn't have to go find like pictures to like Photoshop them together because I can just use, I can just use that. Because they are, they look wonderful together and they, they really embody the personalities very well. Saffron is like very bright and like maybe not quite bubbly, but she is energetic and like um, she's more inclined to smiling than scowling. And I feel like Lily James is like perfect for that. And then the guy, I feel like he has kind of that reticent, handsome, but not too handsome thing that I really associate with Alexander. Interesting. Oh, that's cute. That's I, could, I could talk about this for hours, hours and hours. Thank you for asking that question. Well, did you, I mean, speaking of characters, did you have a favorite character while you were writing? Or is there one that's just like, I mean, other than Saffron, who's your main character and who obviously you must love to be writing books about her, but do you have a, a secondary character that's just like, mm, that's, that's my favorite there? Yeah. In the first book, um, my favorite character to write in the first book is Elizabeth, who is um, Saffron's best friend. They share a flat. They've been best friends since childhood. Um, and she is just so like sassy and no nonsense. She is like a very like prototypical like best friend character. But um, I have plans for her. I have plans for her as the series goes on. Um, for me, for these books, it's all about the character's growth within the book, but also across the series. So I'm really excited to see what happens with Elizabeth. And of course, like I already have gushed about how I love Alexander. So, I mean, I, I wish I could just write books only about them, but also all together. Well, I'm so glad to hear that there's, there's more in store for Elizabeth because she was I loved her while, while I was reading. I thought she was just such a great, such a great foil to Saffron in so many ways. In that, in the way that real best friends often are, where they really balance each other out personality yeah. wise. Well, and I'm not gonna lie, like this is she is definitely based off of my best friend in real life. Um, they are both like statuesque tall women with like fierce hearts. And so I mean, even down to like the same hair color and eye color. <laughs> I was not very creative in my very early days of writing this book. Um, oh, that's, just, that's nice for your your friend to know then like, oh, I kind of made it into the book. Yeah, she's she's in the book. She's the she's the Elizabeth to my Saffron. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely agree. Saffron for all of her um, kind of maybe not like impetuous. What's the word I'm looking for? She's very um, like quick to make decisions like almost in an emotional way but not quite emotional because it's it's not like just based off of her gut but um she's also like a scientist and so she is analytical and she's looking for proof and looking for facts and elizabeth is a poet and so 
she is all heart all the time. And she's like, go with your heart, like do what you want to do, like get in your feelings. And I love that. I love that foil. Like you said, they foil each other real well. Yeah. Well, I love what, what you had just mentioned about, I think this is something that's so perfect about this kind of um, mystery series is that you have these very self-contained stories within each book where you know that the mystery mm -hmm. is going to get solved by the end of it. But over the course of the series, there's there's just this big long arc for the characters themselves. Like there's a little bit of growth and a little bit of personal stuff that happens in each one. So you really get to to track how they grow over the course of, you know, how they interact with each other and how they interact with whatever their mystery they're trying to solve. But you know that you can read each one as a standalone. So I just think that's such that's one of my favorite things about this genre. And I'm really I'm excited to see what you put your characters through next because I'm guessing it won't be all sunshine and rainbows. No, but it is, it's so much fun. It is a great deal of fun. They're going to have a lot of challenges, but also a lot of fun along the way. And um, one of the things I'm most looking forward to as the, the series develops is those personal arcs, but there's also, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, so I apologize if I'm not. Um, but there's also a mystery that that arcs through the series of oh, fun. Um, kind of like what's up with Saffron's dad. Saffron's dad was a scientist at the university before he died in the war. And Saffron's got to figure out kind of what what was he doing? What exactly was he doing? There were definitely some uh, some dangling plot threads there. So that's that is a fun thing to know is is coming down the road looking for clues yeah uh, well i think we are we are almost out of time here um i've got i think one one more question for you um so for the second one obviously you said like you totally totally pantsed the first one and mm -hmm. you were just kind of writing and seeing what happened when you were writing the second one um and you already had your first draft and you were going back and you were uh, you know, tweaking it and Frankensteining it into the book that it is now. Were there still things that surprised you when you were writing it? Or did you feel like, nope, I've got this. I know how, what order this is going to be in, either with the characters themselves, because I think characters can be so surprising, or with the That's mystery. Um, yes, the villain changed. The villain completely changed. I was about halfway through. That's such a through. big change. It was a huge change, but I was like, how did I not? It was so weird because it was honestly like, how did I not see this before? How did I not see that it was this character and not this other character? And so um, actually the the majority of the book stayed the same um, because like the clues were already there. And I just, I had to kind of retune the ending. Um, but that was a great, that was a great moment of realization of like, it's this person. It was awesome. That's so fun though. And that, I think that's one of my, my favorite things about writing is that no matter what, how, how, how much you think you have it under control and how much you think you're in charge of what's going to happen in the story, like there are still going to be things that come out and surprise you. Absolutely. Hi, you two. Hello. <laughs> Hi, hi, hi. That was so fun to watch you just guys you guys just talk. It was it was crazy. Yeah, it was awesome. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you, Kate. It was it was great chatting with you. And I am so excited for your debut. It is a fantastic book. I was lucky enough to read an advanced copy, which I felt very fortunate for. And I'm so excited for the next one to come out. I don't know if I want to wait that long though. <laughs> Well, hopefully you'll get the advanced copy of the other one too. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much for making time to come hang out with us here at Mysterious Galaxy and for doing this lovely event. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you so much. This has been us. so much fun. This was great. Yeah. Well, before we go, um, where can we find you on social media? I know that um, there was uh, a little plug in earlier, but if there are more, please share. We'd love to know where we can find you and follow you. Yes, I will drop uh, into the chat so y'all can find me. Um, but I am on all the socials as uh, at author K Kavari, not Kate Kavari, just K. Um, 
And you can find me on Instagram. I'm on there all the time. It's kind of a problem, to be honest. Um, and also on Twitter and uh, Pinterest. You can find my Pinterest boards where there's a ton of character inspiration, setting, um, and a whole lot of like botany stuff. So if you want to see it, head over and find me. Um, and you can find me at katherineshellman.com. I'll pop that into the chat. Um, and I am most often on Instagram and Twitter. Like, it's also a really good time waster for me. Not the best, but very fun. Um, and I'm there as at Catherine Writes. I'll pop that in there too. Yes. Oh, and I forgot to mention on my website, I have a botanical index where you can find all of the Ooh. plants mentioned in the book, I literally went through and I tabbed every single time there was a plant, you can see that there were a ton. So um, if you're reading the book and you're like, what the heck is this plant? And you don't want to Google it, you just go to my website and you can find all of the plants on there. That's, oh, that's so fun. helpful. That's such a great that tool. Out. Yes, it took a really long time. And I hope that people <laughs> use it. I will definitely use it for sure. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you both again for your time and thank you audience for being so communicative and um, talky. It's, it was really awesome to watch uh, all of the reactions and stuff like that. And um, have a great day, night, wherever you guys are. Um, we'll see you for the next event. Bye everybody. Thank you, everyone. Congrats Bye. again, thank Kate. You. Thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Kai. And thank you, Mysterious Galaxy. Of course. All right, have a good night. Bye. Bye.